Well, this will be a very short introduction because you all know who he is. I, of course, first met him when he was, came out to Governor State University where I used to work. And uh, there was a guy named Sicconi who was the big dog, and David was working with Sicconi. And uh, then, you know, I don't know what's happened to David since then. Uh, but all this accolades, now, David, you may disagree with this, but all those accolades that you uh, achieved, rightfully so, nothing in my mind could ever beat what you did in 1984, because you got Illinois voters to vote for Ronald Reagan for president and Paul Simon for <laughs> U.S. Senator, and that beats anything that the odd couple ever did in their lives. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, David Axelrod. Thank you, uh, Paul and uh, Jay, the Barnum and Bailey of public affairs. Um, <laughs> just can we take a minute, is there anyone who hasn't been introduced yet? That I, want you to, I want to give you your chance. Uh, but what Paul said is absolutely true. It is, it, it's always a homecoming, uh, uh, these events. And these guys have really revitalized uh, this club, uh, but the club reflects the nature of Chicago. When I was in Washington, I always referred to myself as a Chicagoan on assignment because this is always home for me and uh, coming home means so much to me because this is a great city. I always say it's a big city with a, a small town sensibility, a small town sense of community. And in this room, you can, uh, you can feel that. And uh, as I look around the room, there literally are people from every uh, phase of my life. I was walking out the door to go to the restroom, and I ran into Tom Hardy, my old colleague from the Tribune, who we, we, we've worked together first in 1976, and I see Eric Zorn uh, sitting over here, and all my old colleagues from AKPD and A ASGK uh, are here. Uh, Betty Lou Saltzman sitting here, who is one of my dear friends, um, uh, but also famous for having been the person who introduced me to Barack Obama. Um, I've told this story a hundred times, but it's so good I'll, I'll tell it again. She called me and said, "You got I, I just met this really, this is 1992, this very extraordinary young man, and I think you have to meet him too. And I said, I'm happy to meet anybody you want me to meet, but why do you think I have to meet him? She said, I have a feeling he could be president of the United States someday. Right there, Betty Lou. So if you're going to, <clears throat> if you're going to the track, take Betty Lou, take Betty Lou with you. Skinny, I, I want to tell you that uh, it's not going to take much to get me to do whatever you want me to do uh, for the Special Olympics. And uh, we, I was with Justice Burke yesterday, and let me repeat what I said. Uh, I can speak to this from the standpoint of a parent who has a child who's participated uh, year after year in the Special Olympics. And uh, nothing confers more dignity and joy uh, than that program, and it's touched countless people, not just here, but all over uh, Illinois and the world, and uh, I, I just, I can't express my gratitude enough uh, for it. So any, uh, sign me up for anything, uh, which you'd normally do anyway, but, uh, and I do remember that $100, but I'm looking at Tom Quinn, and I must say, I, I did a couple of Quinn campaigns too, and those actually cost me money. So, uh, yes. Yeah, but um, Larry Walsh, we, we were, uh, we were uh, reminiscing. He, of course, was a, a, a poker playing partner of the president's down in Springfield. And uh, in 2007, he participated in a video that we uh, used in Iowa. Uh, and he was in there <coughs> along with Kirk Dillard, um, which uh, just about ended Kirk's political career. He's just recovering, just recovering from that now. But uh, we, we were deeply appreciative for that. Thank you. Um, I've been traveling a lot. I am choked up to see you all, but <coughs> I've also been traveling a lot. So uh, I apologize for that. I did actually expect, I didn't realize you had all these events going this week. <coughs> I kind of thought that I would be displaced by, you know, Coach Q or Jonathan Taze or even the equipment manager from the Blackhawks <laughs> would be a bigger, bigger uh, draw right now, but we're really proud of them. They represent this community too, so. Um, 
I should point out also that my colleagues from the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago are here, but I'm going to save uh, some uh, remarks about them uh, for the end. I thought I'd just talk. This has been an incredibly momentous week um, in terms of uh, politics and public affairs, <clears throat> in part because of the Supreme Court. We saw a couple of landmark rulings uh, from the court, uh, the first uh, on the Voting Rights Act. And um, uh, that was a disappointment uh, to see um, the kind of guts of that act set aside because, um, you know, I've, I've went through uh, a campaign in 2012 and we spent much of 2011 trying to repel uh, efforts to um, shrink the franchise, uh, not just through voter ID laws, but shrink the number of days people had to vote in states that had early voting. Um, and, uh, you know, we saw an election in which, you know, this, we had the spectacle of people waiting seven hours in some cases to vote, some, something we should never see in the United States of America, a country that is, uh, uh, you know, an example to the world. Um, so this, this was a... a um, this was a setback, uh, and it's going to require new vigilance in terms of, you know, we repelled a lot of those efforts, some through legal channels, and yes, the Voting Rights Act factored into that <clears throat> in some cases, um, uh, but in other cases, we just had to organize harder and help people through the process, and now that's going to require more. But, um, you know, I would hope, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, we can come together around the ideal that in the United States of America, everybody who's qualified to vote should vote. We want that. That's something we should aim for. Uh, and the president's impaneled this panel uh, to uh, try and develop uh, 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 approaches to encourage that, discourage the kinds of problems that we saw uh, in the past. Now, the, the, the God's honest truth is there may be political impediments to getting some of that stuff done because I think that uh, the Republican Party <clears throat> sees some advantage uh, given their demographic base, which is older, whiter, uh, in, uh, in, in shrinking uh, the uh, number of people who participate. Democratic Party has uh, the goal of expanding the number of people who participate, and so it's not going to be uh, easy to come to, uh, to terms around solutions. But it is a real concern. It's a real concern. I mean, if we believe we are who we say we are, then we ought to make sure that everybody who has, uh, who's qualified to vote has the opportunity uh, to do that. Second ruling, of course, was different, which was DOMA uh, and uh, these uh, rulings around same-sex uh, marriage. And, and the DOMA ruling was a big step forward, not just because it invalidated that law and uh, cleared the way for the federal government to recognize uh, um, uh, marriages that are um, recognized by states that are sanctioned by states, uh, but also because of the language that was used in that uh, decision that could pave the way for further challenges to restrictions on, uh, on uh, same-sex uh, marriage. Um, but what it did do, <coughs> President Cullerton, I know you've done, you've already acted on this, it does put pressure back on the states. What's very clear from these rulings is the Supreme Court <coughs> says it, it is a state matter, <coughs> matter. I apologize, <clears throat> that marriage is a state matter and that, uh, uh, and, and has thrown the ball back to the states, at least for now. We know in the Illinois House, we haven't yet had a vote on uh, same-sex marriage. It passed out of the state Senate. Uh, and um, uh, I think there's gonna be renewed effort and renewed pressure uh, for such a vote. 13 states now with California who, uh, whose same-sex marriage uh, law was uh, embraced by the Supreme Court yesterday, or uh, the way it was cleared for it, became the 13th state. Uh, Illinois should be the 14th state, and one hopes that sometime soon there'll be a vote in the Illinois House. And um, I think that, uh, let me just say as an aside on that, that uh, one of the difficulties there has been, there, there've been, there's been a real campaign of intimidation against some members and a suggestion that there'll be a strong uh, campaign run against them uh, if they uh, support this legislation. But uh, I was interested in a poll uh, that just came out recently, a Gallup poll, 
uh, that said that uh, whether people opposed or, or not uh, supported same-sex marriage, fully three-quarters of the country believe that same-sex marriage is going to become the standard uh, in this country. So those who uh, oppose it uh, in, in Springfield and elsewhere are, are really trying to hold back the tide of history here, and it's only a matter of time uh, when I think that tide uh, will uh, uh, will roll here and elsewhere. So, but the, the ruling yesterday gives it new impetus. The third thing that happened this week was that the president unveiled a series of steps by uh, uh, by action of the administration to deal with the issue of climate change, and um, these were really significant. Most significant being regulating. Uh, 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 CO2 emissions by uh, power plants, about 40 percent of the greenhouse gases that we emit as a country come from power plants. And uh, the President's uh, uh, decision to, uh, to go ahead and, and, uh, and promulgate regulations for those emissions is a big, is a big step forward. Uh, it's sure to uh, spur a huge debate that's already, uh, that's already going on. It may impact on the president's nomination of an EPA director. He nominated a, a fine nominee, uh, Gina McCarthy, widely recognized as a, as a, uh, uh, a, a, a brilliant administrator and a, a great expert in this area. She had been, uh, I believe, Mitt Romney's uh, uh, environmental director in the state of Massachusetts. But she's been held up by the Senate, and she may fall victim, I hope not, uh, to their uh, uh, to their resistance to uh, to climate change, but we will uh, we will see. But this step, combined with what the president did on cafe standards, uh, uh, on auto fuel standards, uh, it begins to move the ball in a direction that it needs to go. And time is is of the essence, you know. And we all know the statistics about climate change and what's happened in the last uh, dozen years, ten of the last twelve, the warmest on record. We know about all the weather. We've experienced it. Uh, here, but certainly elsewhere, uh, they know uh, with uh, uh, the grave implications of all these changes. Uh, and um, so we have a generational uh, obligation uh, to act. And then finally, the Senate is set to vote today on immigration reform. And, you know, for those who, um, who are uh, uh, down, downbeat about the lack of bipartisanship in Washington. This has been an impressive effort, and our own Senator Dick Durbin has been uh, right in the middle of that effort. Uh, we've seen a bipartisan group of senators beat back poison pill amendments uh, to try and hold back uh, immigration reform. Uh, there's been a great deal of compromise on both sides, uh, and the bill should get a substantial vote. The real question is what happens when it goes to the House, uh, and uh, that is a little bit less uh, uh, certain and a little more concerning for those who support uh, immigration reform. Um, and it goes to the fundamental structural problem we have. There are many, many members of the Republican caucus in Washington who, um, who never face, who will never face a prim uh, anything but a primary. Uh, the core of their constituency uh, is opposed to uh, immigration reform. There's a, a nativist strain in that party and it's reflected in their opposition to uh, immigration reform. And so even uh, if a majority, and, and Speaker Boehner has said that he will only uh, uh, move a bill that has a majority of the majority, the so-called Hastert rule, uh, there's undoubtedly a majority of people in the U.S. House who would support immigration reform, whether they get a chance to vote on immigration reform or at least immigration reform that includes a pathway to citizenship, I think is a very uh, open question. So what's going to happen, I believe, is that they, will, they may pass something uh, that will be maybe just border enforcement, just a bill to get uh, immigration reform to conference. But even that is now being resisted uh, by, uh, by the, uh, the opponents of immigration reform because they don't want the bill to go to conference. They don't want to advance the process. And so they may oppose it. One of the really uh, uh, shocking things that happened in the last couple of weeks is that a farm bill uh, was defeated in the House, and it was defeated because uh, some of the members of the Republican caucus insisted on very um, draconian language relative to food stamps. 
Uh, and uh, when the bill came up, um, this group uh, voted against it anyway. So they ran the Democrats off the bill, and then um, they uh, didn't support the bill themselves and embarrassed uh, the speaker. The majority leader, um, Eric Cantor, spoke for the killer amendment, and then uh, the bill failed. So, you know, whether the House can get itself, its act together in immigration reform is a concern. You know, I'm hopeful. I think this is the best chance we've ever had. What's going to happen in the Senate today is impressive. But it speaks to the structural problem we have. And this, and this probably I get a debate from President Cullerton, uh, because we're the beneficiaries as Democrats in this state of redistricting. We control both houses. We've got a Democratic governor. We gain four seats uh, in, the, uh, in the House uh, as a result of it in the last election. Uh, in many other states, the opposite was true. In North Carolina, Democratic candidates got 50 two percent of the vote, I think, and they got 27 percent of the seats. And this story was repeated elsewhere. And these districts are drawn uh, for that purpose, and uh, they tend to be uh, homogenous. And, uh, uh, and so you get the effect that I said before, which is that 80 percent uh, of these members never face a general election never have a contest outside of their own party. So they're constantly looking over, uh, uh, if they're Republicans, their right shoulder, worried about Tea Party uh, challenges. And uh, that's created a very destructive dynamic in our politics. It's created gridlock. It's created a lot of cynicism uh, uh, on the part of the American people about whether uh, Washington can get things uh, done. So that's the, on the downside. On the upside, and this is where I want to finish because I want to get to your uh, questions. Um, despite all that, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future. And I'm opti and people sort of raise their eyebrows when I say that. But I'm optimistic about the future uh, uh, because of young people. I, uh, when I left uh, the White House, I, had just, I decided that what I wanted to do after the campaign in 2012 was start an institute of politics. Uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, I wanted to do that because I want to encourage young people to go into the public arena, to become candidates and advisors and journalists. And, uh, and I, uh, you know, what I find is, and I think many of you may have, had this, may have the same experience, when I talk to young people today, I think they're the most public-spirited group of kids that I've seen uh, since, uh, since my generation uh, uh, was uh, very active in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, they believe that they have a responsibility to make the world better, to change the country. Uh, they believe uh, that uh, um, they, they need to dictate the kind of future they're, uh, they're going to have, uh, that they can't simply depend on others to do it. But they're very, they're very skeptical as to whether government and politics is the way to do it because of the spectacles that we've seen. Uh, the spectacles we've seen in Washington and, and, and frankly some of the problems we've seen in Springfield and other state capitals, um, we've seen it all over the country. The kind of polarization, um, the, the, the gamesmanship that stops progress from happening. Uh, but my message to these young kids is the same uh, wherever I go, which is um, whether they participate or not, the decisions that are made, and you could see it this week in Washington, in Springfield, in city halls and county uh, buildings and in foreign capitals all over the world, they're going to be made uh, whether these kids participate or not. And every equity that they care about, whether it's uh, climate change or human rights uh, or, you know, for our Republican kids, whether it's deficits and uh, all these things are going to be dramatically impacted by the decisions that are made. And they either participate and try and steer this country in the direction they believe it should go, or live with the consequences. And what's been really, really pleasing, and my colleagues from the, uh, from the IOP can attest to this, we've been open since January, uh, the degree of participation, we don't give credit, this is an extracurricular activity, and these kids have a heavy load at the University of Chicago, so they gotta be serious if they're gonna apportion some of their time to something that isn't gonna help them graduate or uh, advance their uh, degree. And they've come in great numbers. We've had 160 speakers since January. 
at the uh, IOP. We've had forums on issues like gun control, women in politics, technology uh, in politics. Uh, we've had uh, speakers uh, like Elie Wiesel, Tom Brokaw led that uh, gun panel. We've, some of the most prominent journalists in America have come uh, to the Institute to help, uh, to help us uh, lead these discussions. We've had uh, uh, smaller, intimate kinds of uh, uh, interactions with, between the kids and people like Jerry Brown and, and, and Jeb Bush uh, that have been really candid and, um, uh, and interesting. We have, visiting, we have a core of visiting fellows each quarter. Last quarter, it was former Senator Gary Hart, uh, Steve LaTourette, just left as a congressman from Ohio, Republican. Uh, John Favreau, who uh, I, I, I always hesitate to say recently retired as the president's chief speechwriter, because John's 31. <laughs> and using the word retired seems inappropriate. But um, uh, Chris Liu, who is secretary of the cabinet, uh, Haley Barber, uh, and uh, Bethany McLean, who's one of the leading financial journalists in the country. And they held study groups every week uh, during the period that they were on campus in their areas. And kids faithfully came. The exchanges were great. They brought guests. Bethany brought Tim Geithner to one of her sessions. Um, and so uh, it's been a great, a, a great experience. And this summer, I just got back from Washington uh, uh, this morning. Last night, we had a reception. We have, uh, I think, uh, 85. In, how many do we have in Washington? 85? Well, let's just say 85. No, we have, <laughs> but we, we have over 100 interns, uh, but most of them are in Washington. Some are in state houses and city halls around the country. Some are working for not, uh, NGOs. Some are working for media outlets. Um, you know, some in government, some in the White House and cabinet agencies on Capitol Hill. Uh, so they get hands-on experience um, uh, during these summers, and these are paid internships, so those who need the money uh, don't have to sacrifice in order to participate. And I have to tell you that um, I am absolutely persuaded that uh, these kids, uh, more than a few, are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. I've, they are so bright and so well motivated, uh, you know, from left to right. Uh, and I, uh, the one thing that I hope to impart to them is that, uh, you know, we've brought all these, I mean, I interviewed Newt Gingrich in front of an audience and um, uh, did the same with Haley. Barber and others, we're trying to inculcate them with a sense that you can, in fact, disagree and disagree sharply on issues and not disqualify each other as people who care about this country, who believe in things uh, that are important, who have good values. Um, this, this sort of sense that you have to disqualify your opponent has become um, uh, very, very pervasive in Washington um, to the point where it makes it very hard to get things done. Uh, so we want to create a culture of respect, uh, even in disagreement, and I, and I th we're doing that as well. And one of the most pleasing things to me, I was obviously the object of suspicion among some of the Republicans on campus <laughs> when I arrived. Uh, and I assured them that we were going to bring people from across the political spectrum. And uh, one of the nice things that happened in the last couple of weeks was a piece we didn't solicit, but it just showed up in the student newspaper. Republicans and conservatives talking about how much they liked the IOP and how, how uh, they felt that they were really getting exposed to a lot <coughs> uh, through that experience. So I invite you all to come down. Uh, many of our programs are open to the public. I invite all you policymakers to come down and share your wisdom um, and experience. John, you've been you, from your 50 years in politics. Uh, would be great. <laughs> yeah, they're like dog years when you're president of the Senate. So, uh, <laughs> um, but I really urge you to come down and participate, see, support us if you can. I'm trying to raise a little money for our program as well. But, um, but I, I think you'll, sh you'll see what I'm saying. I think you'll walk away from there when you hear the questions these kids ask and you hear the discussion. I think you'll come away saying, you know what, maybe the future's a little brighter than I anticipated, but that I, than I thought. And that, for me, is a great gift. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. If you have
have a question. Uh, City Club E and City Club J are there. Yes, I'm sure. A lot of those Republicans are supporting what you're doing because they don't want you to work against them. But that's a, just a Paul Greenlight. <laughs> Coming from all over, David. I. Oh, by the way, if it's too far to go down to you know where I graduated, master's and PhD, to his institute, you just go down the block to mine. All right. Uh, question. Unsigned. Do you think the res Do you think the resurrection of earmarks would mitigate the gridlock in Congress? This is a really interesting question. You know, one of the things my, my, my colleagues know, uh, what I wanted, one of the things I wanted to do was, uh, and we, we didn't get it accomplished, I still want to do this, was uh, have, uh, show the movie Lincoln and have a discussion around that movie. Because those of you who saw the film or, or read Doris's book, Doris Kearns, who's on our board, uh, her book, uh, know that um, Lincoln used every bit of leverage he had to pass the 13th Amendment, including patronage, and very aggressively. Uh, and, you know, this is an interesting discussion because we, and look, we were, we were proponents of this. The earmarks uh, issue was a very big one because there, there were, you know, a lot of examples of egregious um, waste. On the other hand, if you talk to the leaders, and John can appreciate this, they, have no, they don't have the tools they once had to, uh, to try and uh, encourage people to uh, support things that are sometimes difficult to support. So it is a really open question in my mind. You know, how do you strike that balance between reform and probity and governing? And I've had this, you know, I've had this um, debate in my own mind for some time. I, when I came to the state, you know, I was a virulent uh, reformer, and I still believe that government should be transparent, it should be open, it should be honest. But I do worry that you can uh, reform yourself out of the ability to uh, act. And so um, I don't know uh, whether earmarks, if we had earmarks, things would be substantially better, because uh, at the end of the day, um, what most politicians are concerned about is winning elections and preservation of themselves in office. It's a very small group, I believe, a smaller group, I shouldn't say a very small group, that run for public office uh, simply to do something. They, uh, people want to be something and they want to continue to be something. For a lot of members of Congress, it's the best job they'll ever have. They want to keep it. And the pressures they're feeling from, uh, for example, on the Republican side, the Tea Party, are so intense uh, and, uh, and they are virulently anti-earmark um, that um, I'm not sure that you could move them uh, with that. So I don't know the answer to this, but I do know there's a broader discussion to be had about um, what are the parameters of reform and uh, are there ways to make the system work better? Uh, and is, is, is um, in like, take the case of the 13th Amendment, um, is there something to achieving high ends through low means? I mean, that's essentially the question. So uh, with that, I will not answer the question. <laughs> Clearly, the academic setting has expanded his non-answers. All right. By the way, for the first time, David, in the history of the City Club, someone didn't set up a question. They set up an envelope. Uh, Welcome to Chicago for all you outsiders. You may not open it now, uh, just an envelope. Yes. And we're not even in the General Assembly. This is outstanding. No place else. Okay, moving on. Uh, shorter answers, Dave, or even shorter non-answers. The envelope doesn't feel thick enough. But yeah, I know. <laughs> once, president, once the president leaves the office, will the Democratic Party shift significantly to the left? You know, I, I think that um, uh, I understand the impetus for the question. He's been a, f you know, one of the things that you find when you're in office is that, you know, you have to make choices, and the choices are um, principled compromise in order to advance uh, a public good uh, versus uh, ideological uh, purity. Um, a good example is health care. I know there were a lot of people, not a lot of people, but people, a, a, a fair number of people in our party who were disappointed because they wanted to see a single payer health care system. There may be some in this uh, room. We plainly were not going to get that. 
And the question became, um, how do you build on the system we have and cover uh, the tens and tens of millions of people who weren't covered and bring best practices to a healthcare system that was imploding? And um, so um, the president took that position. It and a president can do that. Um, the question is, will we, will we have a president in 2016? Uh, I think if we do, that president will likely make the same kinds of decisions and will have the same impact on the party. And I don't think we have the same, right now, it hasn't always been the case, I don't think the ideological forces in our party are nearly as uh, strong uh, as, the, uh, as the Tea Party forces are, social conservatives in the Republican Party. They pull them way off to the right. I thought when we lost the midterm elections, I said to the president, I think the, the, the uh, seeds of your re-election were just planted. And he looked at me like I was nuts. And it reminded me of the old Churchill story. Churchill, when he was turned out after the war, you probably know the story, said, uh, someone came up to him and said, it's a blessing in disguise. And he said, well, it's rather well disguised. <laughs> I think that's what the president thought when I said that. But, <clears throat> but I felt like the Republican Party had been pulled way to the right, and that anybody who ran for president was going to have to pass through that toll booth to get the nomination and would make themselves unelectable. And that's what happened. I think it's going to happen again in 2016. Uh, building on that, we have Lois Carlson. Lois, where are you? Oh, right over there. Uh, I don't know what 17th Church means, but. Oh, of course. Here's. <laughs> I knew that. I was just making sure the rest of the people did. <laughs> Question for you. Now it's a little more on the spot here, okay? Hillary, isn't it wonderful you don't have to mention the last name? Like David. Hillary said she'd like to see a woman president in 2016 or 2020. I, I assume it's 2016. Which woman do you see as promising candidate besides Hillary? Welcome to Chicago. Uh. Pass. Well, you have a mulligan if you like. Well, I could, I could, um, I could dance around that. But the the truth of the matter is that I think that uh, the best chance for electing a woman president in 2016 is clearly uh, is clearly Secretary Clinton. And I, you know, I think if she runs, she's going to be a force to be reckoned with, which is why the Republican Party is already mobilizing uh, to try and stop her. So. Um, I think the one who is being a little coy may have been Secretary Clinton when she said that. Um, I think she knows that as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, but I don't think she has to make a decision very soon. I think if I were her and I were advising her, I would say stay away from all this as long as you can. Nobody's going to get ahead of you. And uh, the minute you become overtly political, you become a target in a way that uh, is costly. So, um, I, th you know, my guess is but I don't know that she will run. Um, and if she does, I think that she has a great chance to win. We'll call that an Axelrod dance move. That's good. That's good. OK. Uh, Carol Hulk, not a member of the City Club. If you remember the City Club, I could actually pronounce your last name. What are your what are your views about Obama's climate plan? You answered that. What resistance do you foresee, and what progress do you, do, do you see us making during the rest of Obama's term? Yeah. First of all, I didn't know you had to pay dues to have your name pronounced correctly. <laughs> that, that seems like a harsh policy. Uh, you, guys, you guys are shameless. It's on the application. Um, I think that, uh, <clears throat> as I said, I, I think that um, the progress that we're going to make is largely um, going to be <clears throat> through administrative actions. I imagine there'll be a lot of uh, litigation and wrangling around those, uh, but I think that we uh, will make them uh, the, uh, the one legislative piece that I think has some promise is um, remedial actions or, or preventative actions to help strengthen communities that are subject to um, uh, cl climatic uh, you know, upheaval. We've seen communities that have repeatedly been hit by flooding and by tornadoes and so on, and the president proposed uh, a program to help uh, retrench these uh, communities. I think that one could get bipartisan support, but this is going to be a big fight. Listen, you know, if, only, if all you do are the things that are, 
uh, popular. If they're all, all you do are the 80, 20 winners and you never risk and you never take any uh, chance, uh, then you're not gonna accomplish a whole lot. I mean, the, the, the things that have, trans the hardest thing to do in politics are the things that uh, are for the next generation uh, because people are focused on the here and now. And so inconven inconven in inconveniencing people in any way now um, in order to save the planet um, is not in everybody's eyes a great trade-off uh, in politics. But I, I think that he's determined and I think we'll get a lot done. We have four, it's not that time of year, we have five questions, good. Real quick now, uh, Rod Sierra, American Medical Association and former WGN radio personality. Where are you, Rod? Raise your hand. Rod? Right here. Oh, there he is. What, I hope you understand the acronym. What is your view on what will it, take two, what is your view on what will make or break successful implementation of PPACA? Which means? Obamacare. PPACA. PP? I don't know what the PP means. Oh, I see, yes, that's the full, yeah. So you agree with them? I'm just trying to get my arms around the, the acronym. Um, you know, um, one of the things I'm proudest of is that the president took this on. And I have to tell you, it wasn't because I or any political person advised him to do it. In fact, this goes right to the point I was making before. Um, you know, seven presidents had to, tried to do something on health reform of that scale, seven failed. Uh, 65 years uh, it had been going on, and we were in the middle of an economic uh, disaster when he took this on. And we said, you know, there, this is going to be politically excruciating, and you're going to have to pay a lot of political capital uh, to do it. And he said, I know, I know what I'm, I know what I'm committing to. He said, but what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to take our approval rating and put it on a shelf and admire it for eight years? Or are you supposed to draw down on it to get things done that are important? He said, you know, we got 40 something million uninsured. It's going to get a lot worse. The cost of healthcare is exploding and it's going to get worse. It's going to bankrupt uh, businesses, families, and the government. And he said, and if we don't do it in the first two years, it's not going to get done. So I'm proud of him for doing that. I always say I like him so much because he listens to me so little. <laughs> um, but uh, that said, that said, um, you know, th this, we're gonna, I think that the news has been pretty good on implementation. The exchanges are beginning to get set up. Uh, in California, uh, you know, they, in the last month they came up with their pricing and it was about half of what, or a little more than half of what uh, had been predicted in these in, uh, insurance exchanges. Same has been true in places like Oregon. Uh, and, 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 and the key is where governors are committed to this, things are going relatively well, where governors are trying not to help uh, uh, or trying to obstruct, you know, places like Texas, um, it's, which incidentally has the highest number of uninsured in the country. It's not going as well. But you know, I was at a conference, uh, in fact, Governor Bush, Jeb Bush and I were at a conference together uh, at McKinsey uh, a few weeks ago. And I was struck by my conversation with some of the experts there on healthcare, because their view was, yes, it's gonna be bumpy, there are gonna be problems, there are gonna have to be adjustments. But 10 years from now, this thing is gonna be, everybody's gonna look at it and say, why did it take so long to get this done? And that's, and that's what I uh, feel, I think we're gonna have a little bit of a turbulent ride for the next uh, year, maybe less than we anticipate, but especially in states where there are, there's not support. But I think it's gonna, I think it ultimately is gonna work and people are gonna come to see, it's still not particularly popular, which you know, makes it all the more valiant on the president's part that he committed to it. But, um, but I think it will be in retrospect, just as some of the other major social insurance programs we've done uh, were. Okay, we're now down to the, pardon the expression, bullet round. Now, I know what you're, now that you're the That's new. if I don't answer briefly, you shoot me? Yes. We still, <clears throat> conceal and carry, we still don't, you know. Uh, but uh, though you're the new monster of the Midway, these are blatant political questions. You're old, this is the old David Axelrod, not the kind of measured, yeah. analytical, modest fellow we all know now. Here we go, from, from Bruce, you gotta get more Irish in this club, Jay. Bruce Bent, Bent, Bendiger, 
All right, Bruce, I sold it. Do you anticipate national ID cards for biometric information, medical information, voting information, information for legal non-citizens? <clears throat> Hell of a question. Yeah, it is. I don't know the answer. Next question, moving up. <laughs> Dave Lundy, where are you, Dave? All right, I don't see you, but it's right there. Yeah, right there. Oh, Jesus, this is this is great. Now you only got three sentences for this one. How long do you think it will take for Republican moderates to reassert themselves in the Republican Party? Because Dave Lundy, you know, is a longtime GOP advocate. Up there in the 49th Ward. Um, I uh, I think that the Republican Party is going to have to go through what the Democratic Party went through in the 80s. And I think that they're going to have to lose and lose badly and maybe lose badly one more time. Here's the problem for the Republican Party. They're probably going to do OK in the midterm elections. And, and the right wing of the Republican Party is going to take that as encouragement, just as they did after 2010. But the electorate is so much different in presidential elections. Uh, you know, Exponentially more young people vote. Exponentially more minority voters vote. Uh, the challenge for the Democratic Party is to get some of those voters out in the midterm elections, and I think you're going to see a big effort to do that, particularly in swing districts. But I think the Republican Party is still basically in the thralls of the same people who were in control of the Republican Party before the 2012 election, and I think they're going to they're going to insist on a, on a loyalty test for the nominee on some of these issues that are very divisive and put them on the wrong side of history, and they're going to lose again. And I think after that, uh, there's going to have to be a reckoning. Uh, but, uh, but, I'm, but I think it may take one more uh, drubbing uh, for, that, for that to happen. Two more questions. By the way, the high point is you remember what Ward Lundy was from. That's, that's, that's impressive. Uh, Thomas McElroy, I could pronounce your name and you remember, that's why. Level one global solutions, give you a plug. Can you explain the effect of the voting rights decision on, potential, on the potential future of the Electoral College? Um, well, uh, okay, you, you, you can handle it. Let me just talk about the Electoral College though. Um, you know, um, I, I, I think that there's a pretty good argument to, um, to have a national discussion about the Electoral College. Um, it is really bizarre that we have national elections uh, and basically they take place in eight or nine states and everybody else gets to watch. And that's basically been what happened. I mean, we poured all our energy resources into these eight states. And, you know, that's a function of um, how polarized we are, but also uh, of the uh, Electoral College. Now, in terms of your question, um, you know, one of the demographics are changing around the country. I mean, the, uh, my friend Mike Murphy, Republican consultant, always says the, always notes the fact that the number one uh, newborn, a uh, name of a newborn boy in Texas is Jose. Uh, and uh, Texas has three million un registered Hispanic voters. There's a big effort on now to register those voters. By the end of this decade, Texas could be a competitive and blue uh, state. And there are other places, Georgia, demographic, demographic changes are moving in Arizona. So um, to the extent that um, the, the uh, Republican authorities in those states take the, um, the, the voting rights decision as a, for te Texas just announced immediately after the voting rights decision that they're going to implement their very strict uh, voter ID laws. So that's an effort to try and retard this movement. But I don't think that you can hold it back. Uh, I think that movement's going to move uh, forward. And the demographic changes are going to overwhelm uh, all the shenanigans uh, that may be employed to try and retard that uh, movement and keep people from participating. Very good. To add on to that, the elected Electoral College is based on census, not on who's registered to vote. Correct, Ms. Wick? All right, the last question, saving it for last. My old colleague, Sharon Alter, the pride and joy of Harper Community College. David, you're in Chicago now. This is the City Club, national and international. The last question, you could dodge it if you like. Explain whether and why you will support Rahm Emanuel's re-election to Chicago mayor in 2015. 
we stick it to him. This looks like Rom's handwriting. <laughs> Look, I've, I've known Rom since he was 22 years old, and, um, and uh, his hair is grayer, but uh, in many ways he hasn't changed a bit. He's a force of nature, and, uh, and you know, I've always believed that to be the mayor of a big city, you have to be a force of nature. You have to be, uh, uh, especially this city, you have to be big enough and strong enough and, and gutsy enough to do things that are hard, not just things that are easy. Uh, and Ram has that. And I think, you know, when you look at uh, uh, things that he's done in terms of the economy, things that he's done in terms of transportation, and the things he's trying to do in education, uh, the things he's uh, trying to do in terms of dealing with this violence problem, uh, he has a very good and strong record. And, uh, you know, as a resident of the city, not just as his friend, I am, uh, I'm, I'm proud of him and I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to live in a city uh, in which he's the mayor. We'll see if he has a serious contest uh, in, uh, in the next election, but I think he'll get, he's going to have a very strong uh, record to run on. Wait, I want, he gave me these notes, I'm just, I want to, <laughs> I want to uh, make sure I, I, uh, I hit it, so. How about a great round of applause? We got some party gifts for you, David. Okay.